Good evening and welcome to the Press Box. My name is Melissa Ponzio and I'll be your host on the best of the Press Box. Some of the guys are on vacation this week, so what we've decided to do is not bring you a live show and bring you a tape show of the three best interviews that we've had for this past season. We're going to start things off with Rick Rappa talking about baseball cards and we'll be right back after his interview. Back with Rick Rappa and he wants to make a correction. It was my fault. The name of your... your the store is now Gwinnett Sports Cards. Gwinnett Sports Cards. About five months ago. Right, okay. And to start things off, the first question I want to ask, in the past two or three years, you've seen a huge boom in the baseball, you know, trading industry, and the prices for these cards are just outrageous. And how long do you think the price war, so to speak, is going to last? And do you think this whole baseball thing is a fad? Well, collecting cards isn't a fad. It's been going on for literally 100 years. I started making cards in 1887. Mm -hmm. So it's not a fad. As long as there's baseball and as long as there's collectors, it'll always be ongoing. It just goes through streaks where it's more uh, popular. Right now there's more collectors than ever. They had a show here in Atlanta last week where 60,000 people attended. Wow. Um, that's an Atlanta record. And more and more people are getting into it every year. That's why more and more cards are being produced because it has to have the supply to meet the demand. Uh, Rick, uh, what is the hottest card out there? I mean, the card with the, with the biggest value. Is there any one particular player? Um, currently, I guess Nolan Ryan's rookie of the active players is the most valuable. It's 1968, and it's worth $1,500. Wow. Um, if you go back into the old days, a fellow named Honus Wagner, who was kind of like the Cal Ripken of his day, he's got a tobacco card that came out in 1910 that is extremely scarce. And it's worth it's been sold for as much as a half a million dollars. We don't have that at our store. Right now. And the one that Wayne Gretzky <laughs> yeah, and, Wayne uh, Gretzky and Bruce McNall yeah. bought it for the LA Kings. And uh, that's the most expensive card by far, but currently Nolan Ryan of the active players is the most expensive. Uh, how important is it to, I see you've got all these little storage gizmos, how important is it to keep your cards in all these things, you know, is it if the corners get nicked, does it really hurt the value of the cards? Yeah, that's very important. Uh, condition is the first thing a collector looks at. Um, that Nolan Ryan card, for example, if it's in mint condition, it's fifteen hundred dollars. But if you bend a coin or a crease, it all of a sudden no one will pay two hundred dollars for it. That's still a lot of money. Well, see, this this one thing in particular, uh, could you? Maybe we can get a. Uh, yeah, that's Wayne Gretzky's rookie card. Um, it's his first card. It came out in nineteen eighty, and it's worth in mint condition, $399 or $400. Now, if you, I've got it in this big, thick case. I don't know if you can see it on TV, because you want to protect it. If you accidentally hit it against a corner or, or bang it, it goes down $100, $200 in a half a second. So we keep it <laughs> something very thick. That way, you can just drop it or, or play with it, not even worry about it. Throw it like so, a Frisbee. Right. <laughs> Light a match to a $100 bill. You need to be putting something like this, where inexpensive cars can be in something much more flimsy. Uh, Rick, uh, if you had... Uh, to go out and get a set, and if there was any year that you could get, what year would you get? Boy, that's a tough question. It almost, you have to break it down by uh, which year and which era. In the last four or five years, there's a new company called Upper Deck, and they've put out higher quality cards, and they've made them a little scarcer. So uh, the value of that set has gone up quite a bit for mm -hmm. a set that only came out in 1989. It's worth $200. Mm -hmm. So from the last five or ten years, I'd say that's a set to get. Um, if you want to go back deep into the years, the 1952 top set, which is the first of the modern cards, that's worth like $60,000. Wow. But that's a little bit out of our era and a little out of our price range. So something more current, upper deck 89 is a pretty good set. Okay. With so many cards being printed today, how will that affect their price in the long run? Well, a lot of cards are overproduced now, and a lot of people are collecting them. So everybody who's putting away uh, their you know, Dave Justice and Iran Gant cards are going to have them in 20 years, whereas 20 years ago people weren't really saving the Mickey Mantles like they do now, and they, didn't, they played with them more than collected them. So I don't think they can be extremely high like the old cards are because there's going to be enough of them available in nice condition. But still, anybody who continues to play for a long time and makes the Hall of Fame will always be remembered, and it's like a blue chip stock, like buying IBM stock. It'll always be a good card. Well, what would you say is the cutoff point as far as years are concerned? where they started really mass producing these things and people didn't really, you know, put them in all these fancy contraptions and stuff. Uh, what year, you know, is, is does the cars become scarce or harder to find them in good condition, et cetera? Um, well, there's many different break points, but really around 1980, the hobby had a big explosion and a lot of people started collecting them and the card companies, in order to meet the demand of the collectors, started making more cards. 
back then there was only tops, so they'd make any amount they wanted to. Now there's all this competition with Donruss and Fleer and Upper Deck and Score, et cetera. And they're all putting out many, many cards to try to get their part of the market. So I'd say around 1980, before the influx of all these other companies, was the time when there was the cards were a little more scarcer. I was just curious. If there's uh, a great player out there who's retired and he's involved in a scandal like Pete Rose, how does that affect the value of his card? Does it help it because he becomes uh, a newsworthy event again, or does it hurt it because his reputation is hurt? Um, with his card, it kind of really leveled off. It was increasing in value almost constantly because he was attacking Ty Cobb's uh, hit record, and he finally passed that. So his card was going up and up without <coughs> any stop in sight. But finally he got in that trouble, and people started getting afraid to collect his cards, speculating that they might drop, become unpopular. Um, his cards went down a little bit in value at first, but not that much. But all of a sudden they stopped selling as quickly. And now, three or four, year later, four years later, they're creeping up a little bit. People are hoping he might get elected into the Hall of Fame. But when he used to be red hot, or he used to be red hot, now he's kind of lukewarm. How, how do you know the values of these cards? Uh, is, uh, is there... Is this a publication that tells you about them? Right. This is called the Beckett Monthly Magazine. It comes out, obviously, every month. And it updates the price of the cards as the season goes on. So a fellow who's doing good, such as Mark McGuire, he's on the cover this month, his cards have been going up constantly all summer long, whereas a guy like, say, Bo Jackson who's not playing this year, his cards have been going down. So every month this magazine comes in, and people read it like the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> I mean, they have to have it. They call it once the, Wall, once the Beckett Monthly coming in. And it updates the cards month by month as the players do well or do poorly. Is, is that like the source to look at? Uh, yeah, Beckett is considered the price guru. He's been doing price guides for like 15 or 20 years. He used to come out with only an annual thick uh, guide that came out every April. But now with so many more people collecting and the values of cards going up more often, he has to do it every month. And he is considered the source if you want to know the price of your cards. Hmm. What milestones in a player's career will affect their card value? Uh, boy, there's a lot. Anytime you win an award, um, Tom Glavin winning the Cy Young Award last year was a big thing for him. His cards went up in value. Um, if you reach a career plateau, such as Nolan Ryan winning his 300th game or when Robin Young gets his 3,000th hit later this year, that stimulates interest in those certain players, and that will raise the prices of the cards. But there's always awards and, you know, a numbers thing where a guy strikes out 300 batters or he throws a no-hitter. Just little achievements like that raise the prices of cards. And on the other hand, what about injuries or things that will affect downwards? Right. I mean, uh, once again, Bo Jackson's a perfect example. If a guy, say Nolan Ryan, got injured now and had to retire, his whole career's behind him. He's established a Hall of Fame career. I see. That won't affect him. But a younger player who hasn't put it together, uh, Conseco's one, he gets injured a lot. Gooden, Dwight Gooden's gotten injured recently where he's not as good as he used to be. Guys who haven't established their full range career yet, those cards might lose uh, value because the interest for them is no longer there and people start collecting somebody else, the new hot guy. Go ahead, Joe. I'm sorry. Uh, if, you, if you had uh, to pick a few players now, young players that you just had to speculate as having Hall of Fame potential or that there'll, there'll be some reason really where their cards will be valuable in the future, who's a few that you would pick? Well, as far as very young players, uh, Ruben Sierra is, I think, about 24 years old. He's been playing for a few years now, and he's started accumulating some nice numbers. Uh, the one that really stands out is Ken Griffey Jr. He came up when he was 19 years old playing center field in the big leagues. I don't think anybody had done that since Mickey Mantle and Willie Mays. So he's got a long future ahead of him where he can establish quite a few records. Uh, those two are the youngest players. Um, this fellow Dave Fleming, who went to the University of Georgia, is now doing very well for the Mariners. People are speculating on him. Then you get a little further down the road, and a guy like Kirby Puckett, who's been around six or eight years, Roger Clements, if they stay healthy, it's pretty much established they're Hall of Famers. So you get your early guys like Fleming and Sierra, and your more along the line guys like uh, Puckett and Clements, and those are future Hall of Famers that you might want to speculate on. Okay. Um, as far as the cards go, back to our previous discussion, um, <laughs> do hitters have better cards than, say, pitchers? Or, you know, I mean, does, did the positions have anything to do with the value? Yeah, more people like to collect hitter cards. Uh, pitchers, they come and they go. You know, one bad uh, elbow or sore shoulder, mm -hmm. and they could be gone in a minute. Like Dwight Gooden looked like the greatest thing ever. And now he's an average pitcher. Oral Hershiser was a great, great player. He had arm trouble. Now he's an average player. So the collectors really like to collect the sluggers, like McGuire, Conseco, uh, people like that, or the guys with the real high batting averages, like Puckett. Uh, Mattingly used to be like that, Wade Boggs, because they tend to have longer careers and can establish themselves better than pitchers who are more chancy. It's more risky. The only relatively young player who's a good pitcher, 
um, every year seems to be Roger Clemens. Maybe Glavin and Smoltz are getting that way, but a lot of guys who were stars in pitching in 86 and 87 are no longer stars, where a lot of the hitters from those years are still having great seasons. Let's just suppose that someone had $1,000 that they were just going to invest into, uh, into a hobby. Would you recommend them uh, buying maybe older, established cards, established players, or would you maybe uh, take a chance and try and get more newer players, hoping that something would develop into uh, really a big investment for you? That's the thing. If you want to take a chance, um, if you get the established players, that's no risk. You know their cards are valuable, and they're going to probably continue to rise, whereas the current players, if you could maybe hit it bigger because you can buy their cards cheap right now for 50 cents a dollar, two dollars. If they blossom into great players, those cards might one day be worth 50, 100, 200 dollars. Um, so you've got a good chance to increase your value, but they might decline. The star players from you know, the older days, their card might be worth 50 or 60 now, and it might not explode and double overnight, but it'll continue to rise slowly and go up as time goes by. Uh, how is um, how's Atlanta, the cards of, say, Atlanta Braves doing in the last, you know, basically a year since they've really gotten hot? Did, around the World Series, did it pick up at all for, for you, or did yeah. it kind of stay about the same as usual? That's been very good for business. Um, Brave cards, <laughs> it's funny because two years ago we dismantled our Brave case at our store because nobody was buying them. Albert Hall and Jim Vatcher and Jerry Royster, guys, guys like that, no one was buying. We took our Brave case apart, and then last year they became you know, the darling of baseball, mm -hmm. we had to make a whole new case, and everybody comes in asking for Glavin, Justice, Smoltz, Gant, Avery. Those are our hottest players, Pendleton, Dion. So when your local team is doing well, that really stimulates the hobby, and we've been very lucky the last two years. Okay. Um, with some of the cards that you brought in, I noticed the autographs on them. Mm -hmm. Have you run into any troubles with forgeries? We haven't run into too many ourselves. I think a lot and of how these... would you tell? Well, that's the problem. If you don't know what a guy's autograph looks like, you could be fooled pretty easily. In that case, I tell customers not to buy them. You know, we know we don't have forgeries because most of our autographs, we go to shows and get them ourselves, or we know people who are going to meet with these players, and they get the autographs. So we know what the autographs look like. Uh -huh. But if there's any doubt, if somebody walked up the street and said, I got this autograph of Jackie Robinson, <laughs> and, you know, he's been dead for 15 years, and it looks like the, pa the painting's just been signed two weeks ago, mm -hmm. we just respectfully pass on it. I see. But you've got to be careful, and you want to deal with people that you trust and you know you can rely on. I'd like to thank you, Rick, very much for coming on our show. It was a great topic. Well, thanks for having me here. And mm -hmm. Ty and Jim, as always. <laughs> always happy to be here. <laughs> okay, that was Rick Rapper's interview about baseball cards. He should be back with us this season to talk about football and basketball cards, so we should be looking forward to that. Our next interview is with Steve Figueroa. Now, he was here just a short few weeks ago to talk about high school football players and teams, and we will be right back after his interview. Hi, Steve. How you doing? Fine. How about you? Good. Let's talk a little bit about the Peach State Football Magazine. I understand that it's under a new name. Yeah, it's going to be called Georgia High School Football this year. Okay. We made that change for several reasons. The biggest difference is we took out the college section and the Falcons. We, no offense to anybody, but we found out that nobody in our audience, our target audience, was buying the magazine to read about the Falcons. Uh, they'd buy Street and Smith or Athlon if they want to read about Georgia. Mm -hmm. uh, we beefed up the high school section and made it strictly a high school magazine. Okay, I see. And where are the magazines, I mean, are they sold through the high schools? Or? Uh, you, you need to check with the High School Booster Club okay. or, or call our number. Uh, it's 822-9804. Mm -hmm. Or uh, check with, uh, there'll be some local uh, schools that are selling them at their games. I see. It won't be on the newsstand. Okay, okay. Okay, Steve, let's jump into uh, the season because uh, it's right on the brink right now. And uh, last year... LaGrange was voted USA Today National Champions. Uh, will the state of Georgia see uh, a team uh, compete for that again? I think so, because uh, the most important thing with being voted the USA Today National Champions is that you have some name recognition nationally, and I believe Valdosta will be the team that wins the Quad A State Championship this year. And any time Valdosta wins the state or goes undefeated, there's a good chance they'll be voted national champion because they have that name recognition. Are they going to get any competition from anyone over uh, there? Possibly. Uh, Noonan has a chance. Noonan's got several real good prospects. They had a good football team last year. Uh, the biggest kind of uh, thing that's got to happen there is Noonan is in South Georgia now. They, they're, that region, the Griffin Noonan Moore mm -hmm. region, even though it's m mainly uh, Metro Atlanta, was moved to South Georgia three years ago. And if Noonan was to 
mess up and finish second in their region or Valdosta was to mess up and finish second in their region, they would play each other in the first round of the state. So that would, otherwise they could meet in the final. The, the, the championship game should be Noonan and Valdosta, but they could wind up meeting in the first round. Hmm. Of local interest, moving to 3A now, I think one of the more powerful teams lately in the Atlanta area has been Lakeside of Atlanta. Uh, do you, last year they tied, right, for the Tied uh, Kendrick 14-14 in, in Columbus. Right. Uh, is Phil Lindsay going to have another powerhouse over there this year? Uh, if they can avoid injuries. They had nine players sign college scholarships off last year's team, so obviously they've got some holes to fill. But they've got four kids that are being recruited by Division I schools again this year. The biggest problem will be uh, finding a quarterback, and nobody can get hurt. They've got a running back named T.J. Johnson, rushed for 2,000 yards last year. He goes down, they're in some trouble. Last year they had a lot of depth. They had four linebackers that were being recruited at major college. This year they got a kid named Jenkins that will be recruited at major college. But he goes down, they're going to bring up a sophomore. So they just can't get anybody hurt. Okay, and, and any other uh, schools that you think would compete for the state in 3A? Triple A, I think, will be the toughest region top to bottom in the state this year. Marist, Woodward Academy, uh, Carrollton, Kendrick again. Uh, is, Burke County. Is They're, Rome, Rome going to be Rome, in now? East Rome and West Rome have consolidated, and if they don't kill each other in the halls, you know, these are bitter. Right? This is like Georgia and Georgia Tech consolidating mm -hmm. and calling it, uh, you know, the University of the South or whatever. Uh, the, the coach, Danny Wiseman, has got an unenviable task. He's got like 40 returning lettermen from, from the two schools combined, but, but half of them have hated the other half for the last, for ever since they grew up and they've got to somehow manage to merge and play on the same team. And if they do, yes, they'll be a factor. Mm, How about any teams for Fulton County? Uh, well, Westlake is in, again, in, in that tough Marist Woodward Academy region. Uh, okay. That uh, 5 AAA is loaded this year. I, I don't know who's going to come out of that region, but, yeah, Westlake will be, will be pretty good this year. Going down to AA, who do you see as the top teams there? Uh, Villa Rica could be a real challenge. Mitchell Baker on paper is the, is the Hands, uh, hands down favorite. They, they got 20 starters back, and uh, uh, Jake Rakeley will be one of the top quarterbacks in the state. But uh, Villarica is coming off an 11-3 and three season in AAA, and they're dropping down to AA with 15 starters back. Uh, they should cause some, some trouble there. And in single A, it, it seems that uh, Lincoln County is there every year. Uh, well, are we going to see any change this year? You know, if there's ever going to be a rebuilding year at Lincoln County, which there hasn't been for the past 20 years, this will be it. They got four starters back. I mean, mm. Larry Campbell's not lying to anybody. He's got four starters back. They don't have a quarterback. They don't have a running back. So they, they run the wishbone. First time in, in a long time they don't have any skilled players back. But, of course, you have to rank them. Okay. Uh, but Charlton County and Clinch County should be the, the favorites this mm. year. Uh, Steve, uh, let's take a look at some of the individual players that are being highly recruited in the state of Georgia. Uh, let's start off with uh, Derek Stegall down there in Noonan. He plays quarterback for Noonan, uh, but most people are recruiting him as a running back. He's a big kid. He's about 6'2", well over 200 pounds, runs a 4'5", 40. Uh, are, are we going to show the right. tape that I think we, we have? Yeah, we, we, we got a nice tape. Let's show that tape, please. Against the Grange <laughs> last year. <laughs> okay, here we go. He'd be the quarterback in this position. There he is. He's rolling out. I like the way he cuts back here. He knows how to cut back. And look at the speed. He, he can turn the corner on the defensive back at 205 pounds. Wow. And he's doing that against the pretty He's good doing it against team. the number one defensive team in the state. I can say that because Valdosta was the number one defensive team in the state, and LaGrange beat them six to nothing. So they, that must make LaGrange the number one defensive team in the state. How last fast year. is he? 4 5 is what uh, legitimately. Now, Max Bass at Noonan says he's run a 4 4. Max Bass, now you got to remember, he's coached Drew Hill and guys like that, that in the pros. He says he has the two fastest kids he's ever had this year, Stiegel and, and Corey Bridges, the halfback on that team, are the two mm -hmm. fastest kids he's ever had. Wow. Okay, well, let's look at uh, some running backs here. Uh, Felix Lindsay. Felix Lindsay is considered the best running back prospect. Now, again, some people are recruiting Stiegel as a quarterback, so that, I make that distinction. Uh, Lindsay at, at Blakely County is, is again over 200 pounds. Okay, do we have tape on 40. him also? We have a nice Can uh, we show that him, tape? <laughs> he's number 43 in this tape. Looks like a big guy. He's, a, he's a well over 200 pounds, about 6'1. And as you can see, he had 10 yards on the defensive back when he hit the end zone there, so he's got pretty good speed. Hmm. He had 1,337 yards rushing last year as a junior for a 
fairly average football team. What's okay. Division One speed that they got? Is it like a four four or a four five? Well, again, five uh, a, Jim, you got to you got to ask who's 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 holding that watch. <laughs> it's funny when you, you you know you see the NFL Combine every year. There's not a guy in the NFL Combine last year that ran a four four forty. There's not one. Is there? Correct me if I'm wrong. There wasn't a single four four. Half the high school coaches in the state will tell you they got a kid who runs a four four eight. You know, it's just not it's not accurate. A, a legitimate four five forty is moving. I mean, that's running fast. Robert Listen, Levette okay. on his best day ran a 4-6. Okay. Yeah, there's a, there's a kid named uh, Glisson, David Glisson, down a uh, little bitty Class A private school in Savannah named Calvary Baptist. Can we uh, show the tape? Yes, we have, we have Mr. Glisson. Okay. <laughs> Number 34? Yes. Let's watch him. Here they go. Takes this swing pass and look at the way he, he he's got real good instinct. He ran a four five forty at the Georgia camp. Uh, he was the second fastest kid at the Georgia camp. Uh, How fast? I'm sorry. Four five. So he is legitimately four five. Yeah. Hey, well, he ran it at the Georgia camp. That's usually a pretty he good indication. He looks pretty small. How how big is he? He's only five foot nine, but he's 190 pounds. He's got a 38 inch vertical leap. He can dunk a basketball. He's a, he's an Maybe the next athlete. Barry Sanders. Or <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's a little bitty kid with speed and strength. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that interview with Steve Figueroa. He should be back this fall to update us on the new football prospects and to talk with us about the high school football playoffs. Now, we are going on to Dean Durham, who is the host of Outdoors with Dean Durham, to talk about fishing, and we'll be right back. Briefly, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Sports Life Atlanta Voice, Frankie's at the Prado, and Sporting Times. And with us right now is our special guest, Dean. How you doing? Great. great. Good. Glad to be here. Good. Um, to start things out, how did you become involved in TV fishing? Well, you know, I've always fished and, and hunted so forth. My father, I guess, grew me up fishing, and it's just a great sport, and you know, you try to make a living at what you like. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, <laughs> I just, I've tournament fished for years and years, and I've guided, and I'm kind of an educator, you know, of fishing, and I like to teach young people and so mm -hmm. forth, I guess because I spent so many years doing it. And, you know, I could go any way in the, in the industry, you know, maybe working with a tackle company or whatever, but I just chose to try the TV show, and okay. it's, it's been really successful. Oh, you said you like to educate now on mm -hmm. your shows. Mm -hmm. It's not all just fishing. I mean, you teach them techniques. Well, on our show, we like to entertain them and educate them. You know, we go to various lakes across the country and so forth, and the viewers have the opportunity to go right where we're going. In other words, uh, we provide the number. Say if we're fishing with a guide or whatever, we put their number on the screen. We tell how to get there. We talk about a seasonal pattern of that lake and tell how to catch the fish. And, and uh, you know, we've got special segments, too. We've got kid segments on the show. We've got a cooking segment on the show, you know, and I've also got a, a tip <laughs> on how to rig a lure or something like that, you know, so it all works very well. Hmm? Um, uh, sorry. I'm sorry. I was just going to ask, what's the biggest largemouth you ever <laughs> caught on a show when you're filming? I caught a 13-pound, 8-ouncer uh, about a month ago out in uh, Lake Fork, Texas, which is a big bass lake, and I caught him right on tape there. Yeah. Where? Have you been fishing? I mean, you Texas, of course, Florida, Georgia. I mean, have you been to all part, like different countries? Well, through the you know, I fished the Bassmaster Tournament Trail, and through that trail, I've traveled all over America. But mainly uh, in the southeast. You know, we got a, a, a large viewership in the southeast, and uh, uh, we you know, on the show, we've been to Texas and Florida and, and uh, Tennessee and Carolinas and so forth, and we got trips planned up to uh, New York this year and out to Colorado and, and so forth, and. We're trying to, uh, you know, I'm primarily a bass fisherman, but we're trying to, to fish for all types of fish. You know, the viewers want to see us catch brim and crappie and bass and saltwater. We do a lot of saltwater shows and so forth. So we're going to get around to what, just about what everybody likes, you know. Okay, we have a phone call. Hi, caller, you're on the air. Hello? Yeah, I was just wondering, what's the biggest catfish you ever caught? Catfish. Thank you for calling. Uh, uh, 55 pounds. Uh, it, we caught it over in, in Santee Cooper, South Carolina, about uh, two months ago. Caught it out of 40 feet of water on a live brim, weighed 55 pounds. A flathead cat. Wow. That was the one that we did see on the tape, Yeah, that's right? the one on the tape. It, the we had to, We one. had to show that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and we let it go. You let it go. We let, we let all our fish go. You know, catch and release is a, a big thing now in the fishing world. And <clears throat> somebody asked me earlier tonight, uh, you know, why don't you keep these fish? Well, you know, there's 60 million people in America mm -hmm. that fish, and if, if everybody kept one fish every time they went, we wouldn't have any fish. Right. So. Um, I was told when I was a small child that when you caught a fish, 
it would hurt their mouth when you <clears> caught it, and then you would throw it back, and then they would be afraid to, to eat. Is that true or no? Well, I have, uh, nobody knows, you know, we right. can't talk to the fish, but, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the, it hurt me, but, but I, I have caught, I've caught a, a bass before, maybe, that broke my line. I can remember two instances in my life where I caught a fish that broke my line, and then the next cast I threw in and caught that fish. Oh, really? And then I have caught fish and tagged them. I used to tag fish on a, and, and uh, I have caught fish and tagged them and let them go, and 10 minutes later, catch that same fish. Hmm. So I don't believe, uh, I believe if you catch a fish carefully and don't wear him down and don't handle him very much and, you know, remove the hook carefully and let him go, I think he's fine. That's it's proven uh, that, that uh, there's a success rate on releasing fish. When's the, for just a, the lay person who doesn't really <clears throat> know a whole lot about when's the best time, when is the best time to go out and fish? You know, sometimes you sit out there and you just don't, you can't buy a bite, yeah. you know. Uh, it's, is there certain times, uh, you know, you see those little tables in the paper, but yeah. they don't make heads or tails to, you know, to somebody. Well, my that, grandfather told me the best time to go is when they're biting, so you got to remember <laughs> that. But uh, I don't know. I think, uh, you know, the springtime is the easiest time to catch fish when they're shallow. But, you know, uh, uh, all fish are like any kind of wild creature. They feed early in the morning and late in the evening. So, you know, early and late is always best, but you know that it's, it can really get complicated. You know, uh, it takes years of really fishing to learn how to stay on fish all the time. And, you know, I learned a lot by fishing the tournaments all over the country and fishing for money and trying to make a living by catching them. So I had to produce, you know, to make a living. Yeah. So I had to learn how to catch them. But that's really a loaded question. You know, you just have to go. But, you know, it's not just the catching, just being out there, you know, and enjoying the uh, Nature and enjoying fishing, you know, is, is the fun of it. You know, you don't have to catch them to really enjoy it, although it's, it's a bonus. So that's the way to look at it. If you catch them, it's a bonus. Dean, what are some of the, uh, the hot lures that you're using now? Um, are there any particular that are just really <clears throat> catching a whole lot of fish right For now? For bass? Uh-huh. Well, you know, uh, again, there's so many lures on the market that work. You well, know, you brought um, some here. You want to show Well, them? I got a few. Uh, I, you know, I didn't know the top water baits were good. Uh, now, there's a new lure on the market this year called a sluggo, and this is a, a plastic-type swimming bait. It's a plastic worm that is shaped uh, with a rounded belly and a flat back. And you hook it without a lead or anything, and you throw it out, and you just swim it through the water. It has no resistance, and this thing darts side to side. It's probably the uh, latest craze in fishing. It's probably produced more fish. What was the name of that again? It's called a sluggo. Sluggo. Uh, that's the, origin the company that originated it. And, uh, since then, a lot of the plastic companies have, have copied it and so forth, and uh, I think every, uh, every company nowadays has, has got one. But this has been the latest thing that's been hot in the last couple of years, and the pros on the national circuit kept it a secret for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And finally, the word leaked out tricky, through the tricky. media, and now everybody's on to it. But it just seems uh, to be something that, that bass have never seen. It's mm -hmm. a different movement, and it's certainly a natural-looking mm -hmm. bait, you know, and it's really worked, you know. Yeah. Okay, well, that wraps up our show, The Best of the Press Box. That was Dean Durham. He should be back next season with us talking about hunting. And next Friday, we're coming live to you again with Jim Fiegel and Ty Reynolds, as always, talking sports. If you want to find out who our guest is, please just check out the Atlanta Voice of the Sporting Times. Our schedule's in it. And I will see you at 830 on Friday. Thanks a lot.